Greetings everyone, welcome to Common Ground Constantiaberg. It's wonderful that you've joined us. My name is Nkulu and I serve on the eldership team of Seaberg. I'll be co-leading our meeting for this today with Derek Broom. So welcome to those who are watching online in their homes, alone or gathering with life groups, friends or family. If you've logged in for the first time, we have a guest form that we'd love for you to complete uh, on the description of this video so we can get in touch with you. I'll now hand over to Derek for family news. There have been so many birthdays over the December-January holidays and we'd just like to take a moment to wish you all and pray God's blessings over your lives. This week though we'd like to specifically acknowledge two birthdays that happened, Tamlin Barter and today Sam Pretorius. We hope you lovely ladies have had a fabulous week of celebrations. And then a big congratulations to Sam and Wade Pretorius who are pregnant with their second child, a baby boy, arriving in July. We're also excited for Ava, who's going to be a big sister. Then you may have heard that three of our precious congregants lost their lives to COVID since Christmas. Alan Mullins, Robin Jackman and Nikki Priest. We just want to take a moment to pray for their spouses who are left behind, Therese, Yvonne and Rowan, and their families who are suffering with this tragic and sudden loss. Then we also want to extend our condolences to Vita Trudeau, who lost her mother, and Manula Watson, who lost her stepfather. Let's take a moment and pray for all these families and for the people in our congregation who we may be unaware of, who are also struggling with loss, anxiety and isolation at this time. Our dear Jesus, when you ascended into heaven, you promised us that you wouldn't leave us alone, that you'd send your Holy Spirit who would be our comforter. And Lord God, right now we just really need for your Holy Spirit to descend upon all these families and to comfort them. That Lord God, they will know your peace in the chaos of what they're going through, Lord God. They're your shalom, Lord God. We just really pray, Father God, that uh, we as a congregation, as a, as a fellowship, will, will know what to say and how to rally around and support these families through this, this tragic and traumatic time, Lord God. And Father God, more than that, for the rest of us, those that are going through loss of income, those that are going through loss of jobs, those that are going through depression and anxiety and just struggling with loneliness, Father God, we pray in the precious name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit will comfort too. And that, Lord God, you, you, you will be our healer, as you say in your word, you're our healer, Lord God, that you bring your healing to this planet. In the form of a vaccine or in the form of clever doctors and scientists, whatever way, Lord God, this world needs your healing. And we pray in the precious name of Jesus that you will start to heal this planet, Lord God. Give the scientists and the doctors and the governments wisdom on how to deal with this pandemic. And we ask, Lord God, that you bring an end to it. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. And we thank you that you're a good father. We love you, Lord. Amen. Right now, before we head into a time of giving, I'd love to tell you about what's happening in the life of the church. A reminder that our Tuesday prayer meeting starts up again this Tuesday at 8 a.m. We really encourage you to join us for this time of praying for the church and the city. Then today, after the meeting at 1045, we are Zooming for coffee, so please join us there where we gather in the Zoom room with a cup of tea or coffee to connect with others in our congregation. The Zoom login details for both these are included in the description of this video. We are blessed to be a blessing. We really want to thank you for your continued financial support during these difficult financial times. Every cent you send to the church enables Common Ground to function and to reach out to the greater community and Cape Town in so many ways. Now more than ever, our social justice ministries need your support. Please go to the description of this video for Seaberg's giving codes and may God increase your territory as you faithfully and sacrificially give to His work through Common Ground. So coming out of time of giving, we are now going to sing together. It's another act of worship, but before we do, I'd love to read from us Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God, it is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all the generations. So let's stand and sing together. Let it rise, let it rise. 
shine bright and lift up your name your name shine bright and lift up your name yeah we lift up your name jesus we shine we shine bright and lift up your name your name we shine bright and lift up your name
Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, that uh, we can gather in this fashion. Thank you, Lord, that we can praise you, we can worship you. Thank you, Sovereign King, that you are mighty, that you have authority and rulership over everything, every aspect and facet of our lives. Thank you, Lord, that we can be in your presence and know and enjoy your love and affection in our lives. And we pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Parents, this is a great time for you to look at the links in the description of this video and set your kids up with their age-related content on a device in another room. And so let's take a moment for you to do that. Welcome back. I'll now hand over to Roger Haynes. He's the Congregational Leader of Bloberg Common Ground, who is continuing our series, First Things First, with the topic, Defiant Joy. So please do grab a notebook, write down the important points um, so that you can refer back to them in the context of the message. It will also help solidify your learning. Well, greetings, everyone. And uh, as we continue on our First Things First series, uh, we're basically reminding ourselves at the beginning of a year, what are the most important things to put first? And to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, he said it like this, when you put first things first, second things are better. And, and we want to do that as a community, as a church. Hey, whether you're looking in at the claims of Christ or you've been following him for a long time, Hey, we need in this time and in this season of life to ensure that we are thoughtfully and carefully putting the right things in the right places. Hey, and we need to put God first. We need to be asking God, what does it mean to put the right things first? Today, I want to talk about a defiant joy that would begin to bubble up within you. Joy is a really elusive topic, and it's a really difficult thing to grab hold of. I think of how much we as society are pursuing joy. $532 billion are spent every year on beauty to simply look prettier or better. Or how about this? $1.3 trillion on clothing to ensure that we have the clothes we want that will make us look better and feel better in front of others. Or how about, how about this one? $580 billion prior to COVID on travel, getting to the best places to see the coolest things so that we can say we've been there. That in pursuit of what? $443 billion US dollars on gambling, and that's conservative. All for what? To get a few extra bucks. F for what? What is this pursuit of? $78 billion US dollars on gaming. Gaming, getting on computer games, escaping into a world that will provide some sort of joy-filled escape. Hey, if you're anything like me and the rest of the world, we are in pursuit of joy. Our hearts ache for it. We're longing for happiness. In fact, Jesus spoke so much about happiness. Whenever you read the word blessed in most translations, it actually could easily be translated happiness. We are in a pursuit of happiness. To coin a phrase from the name of a, a movie. Hey, I think of Augustine in the fourth century who said it like this. Every man, whatsoever his condition, desires to be happy. True, right? Hey, move forward. Thomas Aquinas, he said it like this. Man is unable not to wish to be happy. Or Pascal, coming a bit closer to our time. Hey, all men seek happiness. This is without exception. I think you and I agree that we are part of the same world that spends that much money on very different things trying to find some sort of joy, some sort of happiness. And if Jesus spoke about it, it's because he knew that deep inside of every human being, it was impossible to stop that radar that is searching high and low, far and wide to find some sort of happiness. It is impossible not to search for it. And I agree with Augustine and Aquinas and, and Pascal who say these things, it is hard to stop our happiness pursuit. 
Hey, the definition of joy that I want to work with today is simply this, a pervasive sense of well-being. A pervasive sense of well-being. It's a sense that in and around your life, things are going right. And it moves into an experience. Uh, it's not entirely an emotion, but it's a state of being that says, I, things are going well. My life is working. We want joy. We really, really want it. Hey, but we live in a very cynical and despairing world. Cynicism and despair feels like the pervasive and often dominant uh, sentiment of our society. I don't know if you've read the news lately uh, and heard about this virus that's going around the world, right? We all know that there is some real despair around our world, whether it's economic despair or whether it's um, financial despair, whatever it may be, that may be even anticipatory despair. There can be the sense that you're despairing of what you think might happen. And cynicism is much the same, whether it's political cynicism or institutional cynicism that creeps into our hearts and makes it really difficult to trust a person or a politician or a system of the world that has uh, had so much impact in our day-to-day -day lives, or ideological, or philosophical, or even the text that we read, whether it's on the news, there is a cynicism. How do I know I can even trust what I'm reading? Is it fake news? And so cynicism and despair have become a pervasive and often normative and even sometimes celebrated part of society. Hey, this is the world we live in. I think that maybe we look a little bit like or feel a little bit like my daughter at her Christmas concert last year, December, uh, two months ago. There she is at her Christmas concert. And man, oh man, is she feeling what I think many of us are feeling when we look out at the world. It's like, come on, it's hot, it's tiring. I know you guys are singing, but I don't have the song and she slunk down and she simply just did her best to get through her concert. Hey, sometimes our world feels like this, I think. And many of us in our hearts are going, where am I going to find a defiant joy, a joy that can be as pervasive as the despair and the cynicism that seems to be so pervasive itself? I want to suggest today ways that we could access, that we could take hold of the joy that I believe God would have us have. And, and I put in the word defiant because of the pervasive nature of, of despair and cynicism that is creeping into our society to the point that many people are applauded for their uh, cynicism, for, for their unwillingness to trust. And unfortunately, like oil and water, cynicism and despair do not go well with joy. The joy-filled life just simply doesn't seem to want to work well with a life of cynicism and despair. And if we, as followers of Jesus, and you who hopefully following Jesus, or maybe soon to follow Jesus, would begin to access joy, we're going to need to find a defined joy that can swim upstream, that can push against the tide, that can find a way to push back on a very cynical and very despairing world in which we live. The text I want to read today is one of the shortest I've ever preached from. I'll reference other texts, but here it is, Galatians 5 and verse 22. And it simply says this, the fruit of the Spirit is joy. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. Paul's writing to the church in Galatia, and yes, he speaks about other fruits of the Spirit. He talks about love and peace and kindness and others. But today we're looking at joy. And Paul says to the church at Galatia, the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Now, my first idea that I want to put to you today is simply this. Don't pursue joy. Don't pursue joy. And I think that's what Paul is saying here. This is not some sort of snazzy, fancy reverse psychology I'm putting on you. I really mean it. Don't pursue joy. Now, now I, I agree with Aquinas and, and the others, Augustine, who said that we can't stop wanting joy. And that's always going to happen. But I want to suggest that Paul is writing here and he is saying, don't pursue joy. There is something better for you to pursue. Listen to it. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Now, I happen to be lucky enough to marry into a farming family. And so I've got to watch many crops popping up, whether it's sugar cane or macadamia trees. And I've got to watch farming happen firsthand. 
And it's fascinating to watch because really what you want is these, these uh, plants to grow and to bear fruit and to be healthy. But I'm amazed how often I go onto the farm and you talk to farmers and, and people who are working on the farm and how little energy and time they spend looking above the ground especially at the parts of the plant that are actually meant to be producing the fruit or the nuts or whatever the product would be. So much of the energy of a, of a farmer is spent looking at the soil and what's under the soil, the, the quality of the nutrients under the soil, the, the ability of the roots to find those nutrients, what's going on in the nature of the soil. Has it got the right nutrients to cause this tree to be healthy? Because every farmer understands that to bear good fruit, you don't need fancy leaves, you need healthy roots. You need to know that this tree, that this plant is rooted and finding a source of incredible health. Because a healthy tree will bear healthy fruit. You see, pursuing fruit as a farmer would be crazy. He needs to pursue healthy trees, healthy plants. The same is true for us. And I think the same is true for what Paul is saying here is he's saying, don't pursue joy. Get to the source of joy. Find a higher, more transcendent source of joy and you will, by a mistake, become a joyful person. Hey, search for joy like many in our society are. And you end up uh, being a bit like my daughter. Uh, Anna's getting all the, the, the talk today. But, but Anna, my little two-year-old, uh, you just met her on, at a Christmas concert. She, she loves to play all kinds of games. And every now and again, she'll be sitting on my lap and she walks away. And as she's walking away, I lean forward and I grab her and I pull her back. And she bursts out in laughter. And, and it's just such a fun thing because she gets the surprise and the spontaneity of being pulled back against her wills. Uh, it just makes her giggle with absolute glee. And then she gets off and I do it one more time. But it's not quite as exciting, but it still excites her. The third time, she often will get off my lap and say, again, Daddy. But, but, but the problem with this moment is that while she says, again, Daddy, I can't reenact spontaneity. And what I really can't do is I can't surprise her if she's not surprisable because she knows what's coming. Hey, it's often like that with joy. We, we find a, a little source of joy in our lives. Maybe it's cash or career or kids or whatever else, a companion. And, and we start to try too hard to tap meaning and joy out of it. And we lean the weight of our whole life upon one thing. Romans chapter one warns us about this. It says that we exchange often the truth of God for a lie. And instead we, we look to creation rather than the creator for our joy, for our life. And it's a massive problem. That's the world in which we live, cynical and despairing. Why? Because we're leaning our weight so heavily on creation, on the things the creator made rather than on the creator who is himself the source of joy. Hey, don't pursue joy. Pursue the source of joy. Hey, pursue a healthy life and joy will come by accident. Joy will be a wonderful thing that is a byproduct. Just like fruit is a byproduct of a healthy tree, so too joy will be a byproduct of your life. It's amazing how uh, when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, it's, it's life in the kingdom. It's life filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus described what kind of life we would have when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. Think of John chapter 16, it says this, but when he, the Spirit of truth, comes... He will guide you into all truth. He will glorify me. That's Jesus speaking. The Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus. He'll make much of Jesus. So if the Holy Spirit's in your life, he is going to be glorifying Jesus. The work of Jesus, the ways of Jesus, the truth of Jesus, the wonder of Jesus should be glorified in your life if the Holy Spirit's at work in you. Because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. You see, Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit, when he's at work in our lives, makes known to us who Jesus is and what he's like. That is why I said, the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. You see, the fruit of the Spirit is joy. But the danger for us is that we pursue joy and we bypass the source. We don't go to the source who is Jesus. 
if you've got the Holy Spirit. And, and by the way, every follower of Jesus who says yes and turns to him and accepts the grace and the kindness of Jesus, hey, by virtue of that, receives this gift of the Holy Spirit. When that happens, he calls us and he encourages us to the source. Who is the source? This transcendent source of incredible joy? It's Jesus himself. It, it's Jesus himself. Hey, don't pursue joy, pursue Jesus. Pursue Jesus and you will get joy by accident. Pursue Jesus, you'll get joy by accident. Now, I want to do a little exercise with you. And I, uh, if you're in your home or you're somewhere with a bunch of people, would you do me the favor of closing your eyes for a moment? You can do it right now. And I want you to imagine Jesus of Nazareth. This is uh, AD 29, 30. It's around this time. He's a Middle Eastern man. He looks uh, a lot less like the, the portrayals of Hollywood of Jesus than we probably think. He's probably uh, a little more darker skinned. He's probably got a scruffy beard, looks uh, fairly uh, Jewish and Arabic, Middle Eastern look. He's got, uh, uh, you know, Jewish clothing on, traditional, probably sandals. His hair's not well kept, I would imagine. Imagine him. Imagine him walking through whichever region he's in, towards Jerusalem. Okay, open your eyes. Here's a question. Be honest with me. Was he smiling or was he frowning? Was he happy or was he sad? Was he a joyful person? I want to put it to you that in my experience, most people, when they imagine Jesus, don't see a smile. And I hope that's not true for you because if it is true for you that Jesus is sullen with a, with a frown and he's not smiling, that it's pretty hard to wake up tomorrow morning and open your Bible and pray to him when you don't know that he is joyful. The, the source of our joy is a joyful one. He is the God of joy. I love, there's so many verses that speak of the joy of the Lord. A.W. Tozer, for example, says this. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Hey, I hope a joyful God comes into your mind. Because if it doesn't, for one, you're just simply missing out on who God really is. And two, you're missing out on the source of joy that could permeate your life and become strength to you in your life. Think of Zephaniah 3.17. Maybe you've read it before. The Lord our God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. Listen to this. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. You know how you sing in the shower and joy comes out of you and you're letting loose. The God of all creation knows how to sing over us with joy and delight. So many theologians have described the glorious God, the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as living in a joyful dance of unity, deep love and affection for one another. That God in and of himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is epitomized by joy. Is that your God? Is that the God that you see? I hope it is, and I hope you understand that it's the God of the Bible. He is joyful. And when you get that, I hope you want to wake up in the morning and spend time with him. In fact, if you want to see the byproduct of your life becoming more and more a life of joy, and not just that you experience joy from time to time, chasing the the encounter like my daughter does, rather than actually sticking close to the source, like my daughter should. But actually, you want to become the kind of person who is increasingly becoming joyful, not just having joy from time to time. Hey, let me suggest three things, three ways to stick close. And then by accident, joy will become your disposition. Firstly, live in growing communion with God. Live in growing communion with God. Hey, this is about relationship. Hey, consider Anna, who who loves the spontaneous uh, laughter and the spontaneous game that we play. Hey, her greatest chance of a joyful life in her early years is not to keep playing the runaway and catch game. Her greatest chance of joy in her life is to stick close to myself and Nick's and her family who continuously bring joy through different games and interactions. It's through communion with each other. 
Hey, the glory of the gospel, the, the most wonderful part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is to know that you and I, we've got access to God. We've got access to the most joyful being in all creation. That he smiles over us. He delights over us with singing. Communion, fellowship. Jesus teaches us the way of life in having communion with the Father in heaven. How's it going in your communion with God? Hey, don't shoot for joy. Shoot for time with God. Shoot for a growing relationship with God. And you might by accident find that joy starts to spill out. The fruit of joy starts to grow off of your life. Hey, what about the next one? Character. It's, it's not just about communion with God. It's about growing the kind of character that reflects Jesus. I don't think we understand the kind of joy we could experience in life. The joy at knowing that we are becoming truly good people. That you could become a truly good person. The, the kind of person who's, who's comfortable in their own skin. The, the kind of person who, who actually is able to give without any strings attached. The kind of person free from jealousy and, and anger and, and hatred. The kind of person who's not telling all kinds of stories in their head about why they can justify their frustration or their bitterness with other people. Hey, the kind of person who's not just comfortable in their own skin, but is comfortable to, to love others and, and to receive love from others. The kind of person who's, who's able to, to, to cry when they need to cry and laugh when they can laugh, who's, who's present in the moment, who knows how to not worry about tomorrow, who can live today in the present and face the challenges and the joys that come right before them. Hey, there, there's nothing like that. There's no joy greater than knowing that we are becoming more like Jesus. Hey, if, if you want joy, don't pursue joy. Pursue becoming more like Jesus. Pursue the kind of life where you are learning to go at the pace of Jesus, to know the ways of Jesus, to know the, the truth of Jesus, to know the life of Jesus, the, the joy of working and walking with the Holy Spirit in your life so that you are becoming a truly good person, a person like Jesus. Hey, fruit will be born from your life. Hey, thirdly, circumstances. Pursue Jesus in your circumstances. Hey, put Jesus at the center of every circumstance. So often Jesus talks about this and he says simply, if you want to live the blessed life, if you want to live the happy life, it's not that your circumstances will always be perfect. In fact, in this, the Beatitudes, Jesus says, happy are those who have all kinds of difficult circumstances, whether they're mourning or poor or meek. He says, you can be blessed and you can be happy if you're in the kingdom, if you're with God. Hey, when our circumstances are all over the show, which many of us are experiencing that right now. It's not impossible to access God, which by, as a byproduct could develop joy if we put Jesus at the center, knowing that he is the one who wants to celebrate with our victories and he is the first one to cry with us in our challenges. Hey, how are you doing in your circumstances? How are you doing at praying the famous prayer, your kingdom come, your will be done? What does that look like in each of our lives? I can't answer that as I speak to so many different stories and situations. What I can speak to is the fact that I know that the best thing in every circumstance in life is to include the wisdom, the ways, the life of Jesus, and to let him into those spaces, whether it is to laugh with us or to cry with us. He joyfully does it all with us because he's pleased to be with us. Are you including Jesus in your circumstances. You see, if you put those three things together and you begin to stick close to Jesus in circumstances, character and communion, you know what will happen? A little byproduct will shoot off. It's the byproduct of joy. Not just a moment of joy, but you will begin to become a joyful person. It's what Jesus wants for you. It's what I want for you, by the way. It's what every follower of Jesus wants for each other, in fact, it's what the world wants in general. We're all aching for joy. Here's the interesting thing, is that there's a quite interesting path to experience this, to experience the kingdom, to experience this life in the spirit. Jesus says it over and over. He says it like this, repent and believe. 
Now, this is, these two words have become quite uh, unhelpful and, and quite taboo in many people's lives. And, and you've kind of written off both the word repent and, and believe. Let me explain. Repent really is the word metanoia, which is the word for uh, a rethinking, a, a change of mind. So often repentance has been skewed into all kinds of different meanings. But, but simply to repent is to say, I once believed it was this way. I once thought the world worked this way. But since meeting Jesus, I understand now that in his kingdom it works this way. And I rethink about my life and the scenarios of life and I align them to Jesus. Rethink. That's what it means to, to uh, repent. But the other word is believe. Believe is probably even more misunderstood these days in such a rational world. It, it's the word pistis. Uh, and, and, and to believe really in our rational world means to simply mentally ascend, to say, well, it's the way it is. I believe that gravity happens. And so it happens because I know mentally that's what happens. If I drop a ball, it'll fall. Hey, it's very different. If I'm lying down and I know a heavy ball is about to fall on top of me, I act accordingly. Hey, that, that, that's the kind of believing Jesus is talking about. It's probably closer to the word trust. To believe is to trust. And when Jesus says, repent and believe, he's saying, rethink and trust. Put the weight of your life upon this and believe it. Change what needs to be changed so that you can experience the life of the kingdom. The fruit of the Spirit, the, 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 the joy that he wants for you. I love Ignatius of Loyola's uh, saying here. He says this. He says, sin, which is the very thing that gets between us and God. Sin cuts us off from an, from an experience of God. And, and Jesus, when he says repent and believe, he says, stop doing that stuff and start doing this stuff. That's what repenting and believing is. Stop trusting your ways. Stop, start trusting my ways. And, and listen to what he says. He says this, Sin is the unwillingness to trust that what God wants for me is only my deepest happiness. That's what sin is. It's the unwillingness to trust that God knows best in the timing of your life, in, in the ways of your life, in how to manage every aspect of your life from your sexuality to your finances. He knows best. And sin is the unwillingness to trust that if he tells you what to do, he actually has your happiness in mind. He actually cares about you. Isn't that fascinating? You see, we've got three different ways of believing. Uh, I think it's Michael Novak. He speaks of three different types of belief. Three different types of belief. Firstly, you've got what's called public belief. Public belief is basically what we tell everyone we believe. Hey, then you've got private belief, which is what we think we believe. And then finally, you've got core belief. Core belief is what you actually believe. When the chips are down and you're in a corner and suffering comes your way, what you actually believe ends up getting enacted. Hey, core belief is, is uh, you know, we go walking on the top of Table Mountain and uh, you start to try to convince me that, you know, everyone's jumping off Table Mountain these days. It's just like the thing to do. And, and, and deep inside of me, I'm going, I know gravity happens. Co my core belief is, is clear that jumping off the edge of a cliff means I am going to a certain peril. It will happen. I have a core belief that to do that, unless I am crazy or suicidal, I'm not jumping. No, it's not going to happen. Because of my core belief, I won't violate it. Nobody violates their core beliefs. They just don't do it. You don't violate your core beliefs. Hey, you may violate your public or your, even your private beliefs, but you won't violate your core belief. Hey, to, to repent and believe is to allow Jesus into those core beliefs in our life. Those things that we believe at the depth of who we are. And every now and again in your life, it'll happen. It happens to me and it'll happen to you. There'll come a moment where what we're doing, what I'm doing or what you're doing, will simply just not align to the life of Jesus, to the way, the truth, or the life of Jesus. It, it won't align. And, and at that point, the Holy Spirit comes as you realize that it's unaligned, and it's a gift from God to you to say, repent, believe, to rethink the way you're doing this, and come back into alignment. Why? Because you've got a Father in heaven who knows better than you. Sure, your impatience. Sure, you're, 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 you want this thing. Hey, sin, sin tastes good. 
but it ends up becoming dust in the mouth. It ends up leaving a bitter taste in our lives. But would we trust him? Would we trust that patience, waiting, that even sometimes he might say no or yes, but wait, or any other variation of what it means to be led by a loving father? Would you let him speak into your life? Would you trust him? Would you let him come into your core beliefs and go the uncommon path, the untried path that many of us know we ought to go down? It's the path of repentance and belief. Hey, it's on the end of that path that joy begins to emerge. I don't know your story, and I don't know your circumstances, but I do know that God wants joy for you. And God wants you living a happy life. But he calls us today to this unlikely path to find a beautiful joy through repentance and belief. Would you repent? Would you believe? Believe? Martin Luther said all of life is repentance. It's the journey of ongoingly saying yes to Jesus. Hey, maybe you need to repent of one or two things. Maybe it's the beginning of a journey of saying yes to following Jesus for the first time. I hope it is. Nothing will turn your life around quite like knowing Jesus and letting his kingdom invade your kingdom. Because what you discover there is not that you get to pursue joy, but you get to pursue the person who is the giver of all the fruits of the Spirit. Joy, peace, patience, kindness. The kingdom of God begins to flood into your life. And suddenly by accident, joy is one of the beautiful fruits that come. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we long for joy. It's what happens in every human heart. But today we pray that we would not get sidetracked or caught out like so many of us have and so often we do by the allure of a short-term joy without connecting you, the giver of the joy. Jesus, we will have tough circumstances. We will have good circumstances. We will have wonderful things that come our way. I pray that in the good and in the bad, we would use all of them, not as an end in themselves for our joy, but as an opportunity to see that you are the God of joy. I pray that you would turn our hearts more and more away from trying to find joy to becoming the kind of people who are joyful people. Would you coach us by your spirit? Would you help us and lead us through circumstances, through communion with you, teaching us to become uh, friends of God? We pray that you would coach us in all these things so that the byproduct of a life of closeness and intimacy with you would be a life of joy. In Jesus' name, amen. What a great time we've had together today. Thank you, Roger, for your message to us. I really want to invite you to next week's meeting. And I also want to encourage you to share this message with friends and family that you believe would benefit from it. That's the beauty of social media videos. You can just share them. We also have an Ignite booklet for new believers, for those still exploring the claims of Christ. Please feel free to download the Ignite booklet in the link provided on whichever platform you're watching. This is a 31-day journey into the Bible for beginners. We trust that this gift will help you as you continue your faith journey. If you're new to Common Ground Constantinburg, don't forget to fill in the online form in the description of this video. If you'd like to join a life group, receive prayer, connect with a pastor, join one of our online prayer meetings, or access any of our online resources, please have a look at the description of this video, which will point you to what we have on offer. What a wonderful time we've had this uh, today. Join us next week as Luke Harper continues with week four of First Things First series with a message entitled, Holy Ambition. As we go, I'd love to read this scripture over us and it comes from Romans 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Go well, be safe, and we'll see you next week.